Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kim Tavares from the Miami University Alumni Association, and we have a special co-presentation today with Miami Women. Miami Women empowers women, alumni, faculty, staff, and students to make connections and to support opportunities that mentor, advance, and invest in the future of Miami University. And welcome to our Miami Women Giving Circle members who are watching with us today, and welcome to all of you. I am super excited to be joined today by Miami alumna, Rose Lounsbury, class of 2008. Rose got serious about decluttering her excess stuff over 10 years ago and hasn't stopped since. She has given dozens of speeches about simplicity, including a 2018 TEDx talk that has over 500,000 views. She is the author of the Amazon best-selling book, Less Minimalism for Real, and is passionate about helping women use the power of less to find more peace, productivity, and open spaces in their lives. Don't we all want that? When she's not speaking, Rose spends her time writing, coaching her clients and online students to the freedom of open spaces and soaking up the moments with her husband and wild triplets, yes, triplets, in lovely Dayton, Ohio. Rose's advice has been featured widely, and we are so excited to have her with us today. So just a reminder that live viewers can submit questions throughout the hour by using the Ask a Question button below the video. You can also respond to questions that Rose might ask during the broadcast, very exciting, um, using that same link, and I will relay messages back and forth to Rose. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started, and please welcome Rose Lounsbury. All right. Well, thank you, Kim. I am so excited to be here with you and with all of you Miami women talking about simplicity, how it can impact our lives, how it can make our lives better and easier and happier and more free. So I am just thrilled to be here with you today talking about simplicity for professional women. And the way that I wanted to start off today was by sharing with you my stuff story. And we all actually have a stuff story. Our stuff story is simply the story of our relationship with our stuff. So as I share my story with you, I'm hoping that you can think about your own story, your own relationship with your stuff, and see if you can find some connections to my story as I share it with you. So my story starts uh, way back in July of 2009. As Kim told you, I do have triplets. Um, this is when my life very significantly changed. And any of you with children, or if you've seen children before, you can imagine this is a pretty significant change in my life. Now, these were three very tiny little premature people, but they came with a lot of stuff. And I was lucky enough at this time in my life to be able to take a step out of my teaching career and stay home with my children for the first two years of their life. So the blessing of that was I was able to manage the stuff better because I was home with it all the time. And I'm very organized. I'm a naturally organized person. So I had the Sterilite bins. Everything was labeled. I had schedules. I had spreadsheets. I had all these things. And I was managing it pretty well. However, uh, the story continues because after about two years of staying home with my children, I decided that I wanted to go back into the classroom. So in August of 2011, I went back to my teaching career as a middle school English teacher. And honestly, uh, going back to teaching middle school felt like a break. Uh, from being home with triplets. And so when teaching middle school is your break, you know your home life is a little bit crazy. Um, but I went back to my professional career. And like many of you, I then experienced the classic double shift. So I had my first job of the day, my professional job that I would do from about seven in the morning till about 4 p.m. When I got home, I would clock into my second job, which the, was the job of being a mom to my then two-year-old triplets. And do not let this professionally posed photograph fool you. This is not an accurate representation of what life is like with three two-year-olds. This was a, this took hours for the photographer to get this shot. Um, so it was the mom job, as you can imagine. You know, play time and dinner time and story time and bath time and thank you finally bedtime every mother's favorite time of the day. And by the time I got my kids in bed at night, I had maybe one hour to myself before I had to get myself in bed so I could get up the next day and I could do this whole cycle again. And what I found was during that one precious hour of free time in my day, all I wanted to do was sit down on my couch and relax. And I know that's all any busy mother, working mother especially, wants to do at the end of a long day. But instead of relaxing, you know what I was doing? I was dealing with the stuff. 
I was picking up the toys and the shoes and the sippy cups and moving piles of paper around because I didn't know what else to do with them. I was just trying to control the chaos for the one hour of the day that I had to myself. So my days basically went from serving my students to serving my family to serving my stuff. And the person who is not getting served at all in any of those scenarios was myself. But I thought this is just the way it is. This is just how it goes when you are a working mom, you have three toddlers, this is just normal. Well, this all kind of came to a head in December of 2011, Christmas time. So, you know, it's November right now. So many of you might be anticipating the holidays coming up, whatever holidays you celebrate. Um, this picture was taken at my parents' house that Christmas. And this is kind of a significant because it, it um, shows my breaking point. And it doesn't look like I'm at a breaking point there, but you know, here I am, I've recently gone back to work full time. I have three toddlers and now it's Christmas. And we took them from Dayton, Ohio up to Michigan where both sets of out of state grandparents live. And you can imagine what happened. They just got tons and tons of gifts for Christmas. So many gifts that we couldn't even fit them all in our minivan when we drove back to Dayton. And I remember walking into my house when we got back in Dayton, walking into my house, looking around and just thinking, oh my gosh, we don't have room for the things we already own. I have no idea where I'm going to put all this new stuff. And I felt very defeated. I felt very overwhelmed because here I am working so hard and these gifts that are meant to be a blessing actually feel like a burden. And I didn't know what to do about this. I actually thought, well, maybe the answer is I just need to buy a bigger house and then I can accommodate all this stuff. But luckily for me, before I went to that step of buying a bigger house, I had lunch with a really good friend of mine about a week after Christmas, and I was complaining to her about the holidays. I said, you know, Robin, we've got too much stuff, and we just went to Christmas, and the kids got more stuff. I don't have room for the current stuff. I don't know where to put the new stuff. I think I just need to buy a bigger house. And my friend looked at me, and she said these words that changed the course of my life. She said, well, you could do that, or you could become a minimalist. And I want to pause for a second there because I would love to know from all of you, what do you think of, and please put this in the question or the chat feature, what do you think of when you hear the word minimalist or simplicity? What comes to mind for you when you imagine the word minimalist or the word simplicity? What are you picturing? What are you imagining? Um, and I know for me, there were some certain things that came to my mind when my friend said, well, you could just be a minimalist. I thought, hmm, I don't know about that. Um, so Kim, if you see any answers, any suggestions coming in, just let me know if anyone has ideas of what they think of when they hear these words, what they picture, what they feel. Let me know if you see any answers from our, our friends out there. I have one, um, monastic. <laughs> monastic yes we think of maybe the people who sell all their possessions and they they live a life totally of service and they own nothing maybe just the clothing on their back yeah um uh, another one keeping only things that make you happy and getting rid of excess ah okay so keeping the things that you love i know marie kondo wrote that book yeah. life-changing magic of tidying up and she said we keep things that spark joy and yeah, so these are a couple different ways to look at it, right? Monastic might make us think of something a little more Spartan, maybe a little austere. And then, you know, the, there's kind of that other side. Well, let's focus on the things that we love. So I'll share with you that I thought of when my friend suggested I become a minimalist. I imagine something like this first picture that you're seeing here, which is, you know, okay, minimalism or simplicity. Maybe it's college students backpacking across Europe and all they have is what they're carrying on their back. That's really minimal. That's really simple. Um, I also imagine things like this. This might be the more monastic look. You know, I, I'd seen pictures like this in magazines where everything is white, the couch, the floor, the walls, the cushions, and clearly no children or dogs are ever allowed in this room ever. I was like, well, that looks really simple. looks really minimal. I also imagine things I'd heard of like the tiny house movement. I thought, yeah, really simple. You just buy this tiny little, you know, 400 square foot house and you move it around. And that's a really simple way of living. The problem, however, with all of these things that I thought of was that none of them looked like my life in suburban Dayton, Ohio, with three kids and two cars and a mortgage. 
But my friend said to me, she said, hey, Rose, this is really just a philosophy. It's a way of living that many modern Americans are adopting to live with less stuff and less stress and more time for themselves. So that checked all my boxes. Less stuff, check. Less stress, double check. More time for myself. That was all that I really wanted in life. I wanted one hour to myself. So triple check. I said, okay. I went home from that lunch and I started reading books and blogs on the topic of minimalism. And I was absolutely hooked on this idea. And so over the course of the next eight months, I let go of about 70% of our possessions, which I know sounds really dramatic. That's a pretty significant number. But I want you to realize that the most significant thing was not what I let go. It was what I discovered underneath. Because underneath all of that excess stuff, I found these three truly life-changing things. And those were free time, peace of mind, and clarity. So I found that I had that, that one hour at the end of the day when I you know, was done serving my students, I was done serving my family. And, and during that one last hour, I suddenly had free time where I could read a book, I could watch television, I could call my mom or my sister, and it was this beautiful, amazing thing. And so I also had more peace of mind. When I walked in my home at the end of the day, I no longer felt as much like I was walking into a stressful job number two. I still had three toddlers, okay? It was still kind of crazy, but it was way less stressful. There was way more peace and calm in my life at home and also in my life at work. And the third thing I found was clarity. For the first time since having my triplets, I had the mental clarity to think and dream, which resulted in some really unexpected changes for me, like starting my own business and writing a book, giving a TED Talk, things I didn't even have the mental capacity to consider when I was spending all my excess energy dealing with my stuff. So I want you to realize that today we're talking about your home, we're talking about simplicity, we're talking about the way things look, but truly the entire point of sim simplifying your life is to get more of those three things in your life, more free time, more peace of mind, and more mental clarity. So here are the things we're gonna learn today. We are going to learn what simplicity is, why it matters for professional women now more than ever, and how you could get started on your own simplicity journey today. So let's talk about what simplicity is. The definition that I'm going to share with you is my personal definition. I believe that simplicity is getting very clear about what you want and then having the guts to let go of everything else. And when I think about my own personal journey, this was actually what I did. I got really clear about what I wanted. What I really wanted in my life at that time more than anything was one hour to myself at the end of the day. That doesn't sound like a really huge request, but at that season of my life, that was a really big request. I just wanted an hour for me. Now, I got clear about that, but in order to get that, I had to have the guts to let go of everything that was getting in the way of that hour. And I want you to know that I use the phrase have the guts very intentionally, because if you've ever tried to do this, you know that it's not inherently easy to deal with our stuff. And that's because when we're dealing with our stuff, we're actually dealing with our emotions about our stuff. And emotions can be difficult. When we face our things, we can face emotions like guilt or regret or fear or obligation or deep sadness. And so I want you to know that near the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you some tips that are going to help you if you are dealing with some of those emotional aspects of your things. But this is really what simplicity means to me. It means getting clear about what you want and then having the guts to let go of everything that is not in alignment or leading toward that thing. I also believe that simplicity is a process. And this is a big one because a lot of times maybe you hear a presentation like this or you watch a TED talk or you watch a documentary and you think, oh, wow, this is great. Then you look around at your house and your work and you think, oh my gosh, I, I don't even know where to begin. There is so much stuff in here. And I want you to know that this is a process and it's a process that is still even ongoing for me. So when I started, I started with my towels. And um, if you watch my TEDx talk, which is called How Many Towels Do You Need? You'll hear a lot more about that particular aspect of my life. And then I pretty quickly moved to my kitchen. Um, and the first time I went through my kitchen, I remember thinking, well, I've done it. I have decluttered and simplified, simplified and minimized this kitchen. Well, 
a couple months later, I'm, you know, in my kitchen every day and I'm thinking, well, why did I keep all these spatulas? Why did I keep all these pot holders? Why did I keep all these decorative platters? And I let go of even more because simplicity really is like peeling back the layers of an onion. And as you learn to live with less, you find that you can learn to live with even less than you originally thought. And then the even crazier thing happened, which was it didn't just stop with my stuff. I went through my house. I let go of the, you know, 70% of the things. And I thought, well, this is simplicity. This is minimalism. And I had no idea at that time that simplicity was going to ripple out into all these other aspects of my life because simplicity truly is a lifestyle. And simplicity has affected my career, my finances, my health, my relationships, my schedule and my expectations. Because if you think of that definition, which is that simplicity is getting very clear about what you want and then having the guts to let go of everything else, think about your career right now. What do you want in your career? What would you love your career to look and feel like? What do you desire your professional track to be? Get clear about that. Get a vision on that. And then what do you need to have the guts to let go of in order to get that. That's the second part of that definition that's often a real challenge for us. And I'll, I'll give you an example from my own life, my career. I got to a point after decluttering my excess physical things that I realized in my career, I wanted more freedom of time. Anyone who's ever been a teacher, you a classroom teacher's job is not a job where you have flexibility of time. There are literal bells that tell you when you start, when you finish, when you move from one thing to the next. It's very hard to take personal time off. And my kids were about four or five years old. And I thought, I really want to be able to go to their Halloween party. I want to be able to go to the Christmas parade. And I couldn't because of the career path that I was in. And I thought, I want a career with more flexibility. But guess what I had to do? I had to have the guts to let go of my teaching career in order to get that. And that was very scary. But I, I did do that. I started my own business where I can set my own hours and I can have flexibility of time. It required guts to do that. And I'm not here to say that you should quit your job or that you should change careers, but realize that whenever there's something we really want in life, whether that's in our homes or in our careers or in our relationships, the reason we don't have it right now is because there's something in the way. And in order to get what we want, we're going to have to look at what's in the way and we are going to have to clear that out. And it's not always physical things. Let's look at, um, for example, relationships, right? Obviously, we all want certain things in our relationships. So if we think of our closest relationships, if we got very clear about what we want from our partners or what we want with our children or what we want with our friends or what we want with our mom or our dad, or our sisters or brothers, if we got clear about that, what would we need to have the guts to let go of in order to have that kind of relationship? And sometimes those are expectations that we have of ourselves or others, patterns of behavior that we are participating in and creating. And so you can see really quickly how simplicity, we can apply it to our towels, we can apply it to our coffee mugs, and we can also apply it to nearly every other significant aspect of our lives. And that was what was most life-changing for me was once I decluttered my home, the simplifying did not stop. It actually just got deeper and more expansive in my life. So keep this definition in your mind as you look around at your stuff. And as you think about those bigger aspects of your life, what do you really want? What do you need to have the guts to let go of in order to get that? So why does it matter? We're going to take a little quiz here. So get ready to participate with me. And Kim is going to be monitoring uh, the answers for me. We're going to take a little quiz to test your stuff smarts. Because one of the things I do believe is that when we want to go on a simplicity journey, I believe the easiest first step is with our stuff. So our quiz questions are all going to be about physical stuff. All right, put in the, in the chat or the question box your answer here. What percentage of American garages are so full of stuff that homeowners can't park inside? What do you think? So we have a little bit of a delay while people are answering this, but I just wanted to circle back on your first question while we were waiting. And it was really interesting to see that minimalist had a really negative connotation to some people, but simplicity, that really is what, you know, that felt that simplicity meant keeping joy. 
um, being organized, you know, so um, it, it definitely had a different connotation once you got talking about it in that term versus the minimalist. Um, so we do have some answers here. Um, we have Goodness, I'm going to start with our low here. Somebody said 20% uh, um, of Americans can't uh, park inside. We've got a 33%. Um, we've got some in the 40 group. And then we jump up to, uh, we've got a 50 or a 60, and then 75 is our highest one. Is it higher than 75? It is actually exactly 75. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're on the high end here. Now, what's so interesting to me about this particular statistic is garages, especially we're all in Ohio. Well, maybe we're not all in Ohio. We're alumni. We could be everywhere. But if you're in Ohio or a state with snow, the garage is really important for the car because then you don't have to scrape the ice off the car, which is just such a chore in the morning. And this car that we're using probably every single day, and it would be so helpful to not have to scrape that ice off it. We're many of us, 75% of us are scraping the ice because we're giving that garage space to things I'm guessing that we are not using every single day. Boxes of memorabilia and things that we don't really know what else to do with and the old couch and the printer that no longer works. That's the stuff that's getting the nice, cozy garage space. And the thing that we're using every day that would make a big difference in our daily lives is out on the street where we have to scrape it every single morning. So Something to think about um, as you are thinking about uh, the priorities of things in your life. All right, the next question is um, American homes. And you're going to say for your answer, doubled, tripled, or quadrupled. So American homes have nearly doubled, tripled, or quadrupled in size in the last 50 years. Yet one in 10 Americans pays to rent an offsite storage unit. What do you think? Have we doubled? Have we tripled? Or have we quadrupled in size with our homes in about the last 50 years or so? Um, and Kim, if you see any answers, let me know. I will. Um, there were definitely some people who felt like you had been to their house and taken a picture, though, of the garage. <laughs> they, they were they felt a little seen there. With that. I got that picture off Google. That's no. <laughs> All right, she was no not. She was not stalking anybody. Do not. It was not your house. Um, we are going. I've got one doubled, but. Um, it looks like we're tied right now on the on the idea of tripled or quadrupled. Let me refresh one more time and see if we get a clear winner here. Well, I don't know. They're pretty evenly split. Some doubled, some tripled, and some quadrupled. I will tell you how it seems like those storage unit spaces are doubling everywhere, and they're getting built constantly, aren't they? Yes, they are. Um, I will tell you. The storage unit industry, the self-storage unit industry didn't really exist much beyond like 25-ish years ago. Wow. And it is a booming industry, real estate wow. industry. Um, they actually gross more annually as an industry than the NFL. Wow. So, you know, I always tell people that because I'm like, you know, if you're looking for a little side business, not a bad idea, but I'm also a little bit morally opposed to self-storage. <laughs> I do think there are reasons to have it. There are absolutely reasons to put things in storage, right. um, but the explosion that we've seen is kind of indicative. So the answer here actually is tripled. So we're living in homes that are about triple the size of homes that were built 50 years ago. The home I live in was built in the 1930s. And one of the things when we decided, you know, when I minimized all the things and I decided to stay in the home built in the 1930s, that's about 1600 ish square feet. Uh, I realized that this is actually the right size home for a family of my size if we don't have all the excess stuff. If we had kept all our excess stuff and continued our path of acquiring more, I probably would have had to move to that double or triple size home to comfortably accommodate all of the things. Um, and I just like to always put this slide up here because I took this picture, we were talking about storage. Um, this is what a storage unit in Dayton, Ohio would have cost you in the summer of 2021. I took this picture when I went to pick my daughter up from an art camp a couple summers ago, downtown Dayton, 60 bucks a month. It's now $65 a month. I didn't take another picture, but I drove by summer of 2022. It's gone up to, you know, $65. I guarantee you next summer, it'll be 70, 75. And so again, this is why it's a, a great business idea because you raise the rent and people keep probably paying. Um, but also think about over the course of 10 or 15 years, what else you could have done with that money than spend it on storage. You probably could have taken several awesome vacations, might've been able to even build an addition on your own house. Um, so it's just something to really think about 
I'm not demonizing the self-storage unit industry, but I just want people to be aware of how this can feed our consumer culture. All right, our next question, um, because we are talking to Miami women, uh, women spend on average how many years of their lives shopping? What do you think? In I'm glad that my husband's not watching this with me right now. I mean, I think about like, you know, you'd have your tabs open while you're doing work and that's the, the page here of whatever yeah. you're shopping for. <laughs> I in addition to going out. I did this presentation once. Um, I've, I've done it in person several times and there was a couple in the front row and an older gentleman and his wife and he goes, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was his answer. To all that. of them. <laughs> Well, we are getting some answers. We've got some low end, two, four, five, but then we've got some that jump to 10 and to 20. All right. Uh, well, let's see that the answer here is, is oh. eight. So we're kind eight. of, you know, in the middle of those, those numbers. And again, you know, just thinking about the average lifespan, you know, 80 some years, do we want to be spending a 10th of our lives shopping, you know, in person, online, um, is that how we want to spend our time on earth? Obviously, some of it's inevitable, but we have to shop for things. I have to go on Zappos and buy my son new shoes. This is the truth of life. But how much time do we really want to be spending devoted to that particular activity? All right. Our last one is true or false. Uh, so we always got to have a good true or false. True or false, clutter competes for your attention and wears down your ability to focus. What do you think? And this is from the Princeton University Neuroscience Institute. So these are very smart people who did a study on this. Um, visual clutter, visual clutter. Does that compete for your attention? Does it wear down your ability to focus? Is that true or false? What do we think, Kim? I, I have a from Lynn, an all caps with an exclamation point, true. <laughs> uh, that's come in here. And absolutely true 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 the trues are just ringing here uh resoundingly so awesome i well, have to agree <laughs> it is it is all caps true and you know I, I think about this in terms of how we work you know a lot of us have professional careers you're maybe working at home or you're working in an office and i want you to think about the visual environment that you're in i mean the number one thing we need to do at work is focus we need to pay attention we need to focus and we need to get our jobs done and be productive and if our environment is visually distracting it's actually proven by the very smart people at princeton that we can't do our best work we are distracted when there's visual clutter we can't focus we can't pay attention and so one of the things and even david allen who is a productivity guru he wrote getting things done if you're familiar with the gtd system you know him one of the things that he tells people is if you can't focus you should clean house meaning if you're struggling to prioritize you don't know what to work on take a moment, clear your desk, clear the space, because when you have a clear outer space, it actually affects your ability inside to choose the top priority, choose what's going to move the needle, do your best work. So time spent clearing visual clutter is actually a bonus in that it looks nice, but really it's gonna help you focus on doing the things that really matter in your life and in your work. Oh, it's that wasn't the last one. I have another question. I forgot I had this one. All right. A UCLA study found that working mothers who described their homes as messy or chaotic had increased levels of what in their saliva? And this is multiple choice. So you can choose A, chocolate, B, wine, C, cortisol, or D, all of the above. So they did a study and they, they asked these working moms, hey, tell us what your home looks like. And if the mom said, oh, it's a disaster, it's messy, it's chaotic, they tested their saliva and they found the ones that used words like that had something in the saliva that the other ones did not have as much of. And what do we think? Kim, we getting any answers here? We are. We're getting uh, cortisol as our top along with all of the above. <laughs> you know, I appreciate those of you picking me. Um, and I always just like to say they weren't checking for the other two things. So who <laughs> knows? There could have been elevated levels of chocolate and wine in the saliva yeah. as well. But it was cortisol, um, which is C, um, the stress hormone. Cortisol is what your body produces when you're in fight or flight. And I want you to think about uh, your home right now. And if you would describe it this way, if you perceive it as messy or chaotic, you're actually living under a, a state of heightened stress all the time. And often we're so used to this that we don't even notice it anymore. It just becomes the normal. And we don't really notice it until it's gone, until it's lifted, until some of that stuff or that excess is, is removed from our house. And then we think, wow, 
I feel better. I used to, when I started my business, I'll let you know, I didn't always do it as an online thing. I started going to people's homes in Dayton, Ohio, side by side, helping them clear their clutter, get their homes organized. And the thing that every single client told me when I left their home, no matter if they were in like a you know huge mansion or a studio apartment, they all said, I feel so much better. I feel so much better. Yes, it looked better. It looked nicer. It was cleaner and more organized. But the main difference was in how they felt in that space because that cortisol was able to finally go down. All right. So you're in, I have sold you, I hope, on this. But how do we do this? How do we get started? What are the steps that we can take to begin to make these changes in our lives? I'm going to give you two pieces of advice that answer most of the questions I get about how to get started um, on this. And the first is to start with your own stuff. I know a lot of times when you're hearing a presentation like this, you might think, you know, the person who really needs to hear this is my partner or my teenage kids or my brother-in-law who's got all his stuff in our basement and we've been saving it for him for 10 years till he gets his own place. And I'm not going to say that your partner, your kids, and your brother-in-law wouldn't benefit from this, but you know, Gandhi told us, be the change you wish to see in the world. I will tell you, be the change you wish to see in your home. If you desire to live in a home that is more simplified, that has more open spaces, that feels lighter and more free, the best way to go about that is not by trying to convince everybody that you live with that they should get rid of their stuff. The best way to go about it is by modeling the behavior you want to see. Deal with your own stuff, whatever is under your jurisdiction. Maybe your personal care products, your clothing. If you're the cook, the things in the kitchen are probably your stuff that you can deal with. And I will tell you, I've seen it in my own life, in the lives of all my clients and students. When you model the behavior, the people you live with take notice and they just naturally will get on board. I'll tell you a story. When I started doing this back in 2000, early 2012, I only dealt with, I had the wherewithal to know I should only deal with my own stuff. Now the triplets were too, so I dealt with their stuff because they were too little to have an opinion. But I didn't deal with my husband's stuff. And so I remember very distinctly the day that I was like, I'm taking care of the bedside tables. And y'all know the bedside tables. There's like receipts and nail clippers and five tubes of chapstick and a bunch of cords. That's what's on the bedside tables and change. Always some change. Like we need to spend money when we're, on the bed. we're, in, we're in bed. We got pennies and quarters. So I'm like, all right, I'm taking care of mine. I, I simplify it, declutter, organize. It looks so good. And I look over to the other side of the bed to my husband's bedside table. And it's just a disaster. And I basically had to like sit on my hands to not go over there and deal with it. But I'm like, no. No, I'm not going to touch his stuff. I'm going to let him deal with his stuff. About a week later, his mom came to visit and I overheard him say to her, well, his mom came to visit and he cleaned up his bedside table. It's not like his mom was going to be in our bedroom. He cleaned up his bedside table and he said to his mom, he said, I don't know what's going on, but Rose is cleaning up everything in the house and I don't want to look like such a slob. I hadn't said a word to him. So when you are the change you wish to see, the people that you live with will take notice and they will naturally get on board and follow your example. So start with your own stuff, the things that are under your jurisdiction and let your influence spread outward. The second piece of advice that I will give you is to start somewhere easy. So remember when we talked, I spent quite a bit of time talking about having the guts to let go. When we are dealing with our stuff, we're not actually dealing with our stuff. We are dealing with our feelings and our emotions about our stuff. And our feelings and emotions can be really difficult. A lot of times when people think about simplifying or decluttering, immediately our minds go to the really emotionally difficult things. And those would be typically things in the attics and the basements and the garages and the spare closet in the guest room. It's the memorabilia, it's the cards and letters, it's the stuff from our kids when they were babies. It's the things that we inherited when our grandmother passed away. These things are, are can be emotional minefields. They are just dense and rich with feelings and emotions. They are not easy to deal with. So we don't want to start there, even though that's where our brain first goes. Do not start there. Start where it feels easiest. It's not a surprise to me that when I started my journey, I started with my towels. I started by asking myself, 
How many towels do I need? Why? Well, it was kind of my own stuff. I mean, my husband, I did ask him. He didn't really care about how many towels we had, but also it was really easy. I don't have a strong emotional connection to my towels. I don't fondly remember every single time I've dried my hands on them. So it was a very easy place to begin. And then I was slowly able to build up my, you know, minimizing muscles, my decluttering strength. And eventually, yeah, I dealt with the boxes in the attic, the childhood memorabilia, the photographs and all of those things, but I did not begin there. So start with your own stuff, whatever is yours, and start somewhere easy, wherever it feels easy to you. And if you follow those two pieces of advice, I guarantee you are going to pick a great place to begin that's going to make a difference for you. But how, right? How do, okay, I've, I've identified my stuff. I've identified that it's easy, but like, what exactly do I do? Like I'm looking at the closet now and I don't know how to begin. So I'm going to teach you right now my four step less method, which you can use to declutter any physical space except paper. Paper has a different thing. Um, in my book, which is called Less Minimalism for Real, I talk about this method and I talk about my paper method in that book too. But I'm going to give you the highlights right now so that you could even go home today and get started. So this is an acronym. I'm a former teacher. I love acronyms because I think it helps people remember and learn things better. So the L stands for lay out your vision and purpose. So basically any space that you're looking at that you want to simplify, think about what do you want to see and feel? That's the vision in the space. And what's the purpose of it? Why does it exist in your home or in your life? So get that vision and purpose really clear. And I actually encourage you to even write that down on a piece of paper and tape it up. And the reason is because once you've decided the vision and purpose, you've already said no to a lot of the stuff that you're going to find inside. Because basically you've said everything in here has to fit that. It has to help me get closer to that. And if it doesn't, it's actually keeping you from getting close to that. So we get the vision and purpose first. Then the next step, the E of the last method is empty. You're going to empty the space completely. Now, smaller space, obviously, this will be easier than a bigger space. You can empty in chunks. If you were working in a garage, for example, you might do one shelf at a time as opposed to trying to empty a whole garage. But if it's just one closet or one drawer, you can empty the entire thing out. And here's the reason why I, I want you to empty the space, because a lot of us are like, well, why don't I just go through and cherry pick the stuff I don't want? And the reason is because the way our brains work and the way they were designed is to notice novelty. So when we were, you know, on the savanna hunting and gathering, if we heard a sound or we saw something unusual, it got our attention and it often saved our life. And this is why the notifications on our phones are so distracting because they're novel and they're new. And it's like, ooh, ooh, you get my attention. But the same thing happens with our stuff, right? If something has been on your bookshelf, a little owl figurine has been on your bookshelf for 10 years you actually no longer see it. Your brain gazes right over it because it's not novel and new enough to, to be worth noticing. So in order to shake your brain up enough to recognize it as new, you need to take it off. You need to empty it. You need to see the spaces if you're just moving in. And suddenly you can actually see that owl figurine and decide, do I really love this or not? Do I need it or not? So that's the purpose of that. Then you do a sort, and there's two sorts that you do. And the first is a like with like sort. The second is a decision sort. Uh, a like with like sort just means you're going to put all the similar things together. So if this was your kitchen, for example, you'd put all the spatulas together, all the coffee mugs together, all the baking sheets together. Why? Because it's really revealing how much of the same type of thing we have. When you see that you have 47 coffee mugs and nobody in your home drinks coffee, it becomes much easier to let go of some of those extra mugs. So once you've got your like with like piles, you do the second sort, which is you actually go through and decide what stays and goes. So you go through each of those piles and say, okay, do I keep you? Are you a donation? Are you trash? Do you belong somewhere else in my home or my office? Or are you an item that I'm going to sell? And then the very final step, the last S is systemize, which is the same as organize, but organize doesn't make a nice acronym. So systemize is the word we're going to use. And this is a step at which if you want to, you know, you put things back in an organized way. If you want to buy some bins or baskets, you want to label things. Beautiful. This is a step at which to do that. I'll tell you the reason I see people fail at getting organized over and over again is because they try to start at the last step. They try to start by going to Target and the container store and buying the bins and the baskets. They try to start by going on Pinterest and looking up systems and then putting the systems in place. And we'll tell you, 
What happens when you do that is you simply organize your clutter and it will not stay organized or it will stay organized through extreme effort on your part. When I think back to my story, I spent an hour every night trying to get my things back to a set point, trying to reorganize my things that were already organized. Once I cleared out and decluttered and simplified significantly, for me, 70% of my things, the systemizing and the organizing was really, really easy at that point. Okay, so you want to do it in this order because it's going to be the order that's going to make this last and you're not going to have to redo it over and over again. All right, so we're gonna practice. We have a few minutes left. I always like to see actual examples of how this looks. So um, I have an example here and in the in the chat box and the question, if you know what this is, put it in the chat and Kim, Kim will tell me if she sees some good answers. You probably have one of these or more at home probably in the kitchen. Yep. Yep. Kim, Kim is recognizing Kim is, Kim is resonating with this. I very uh, much so. Uh. Yeah. yeah. Are we uh, seeing anybody in the chat who also understands what we're looking at here? A uh, lot of people who understand what you're talking about for sure. Let's see if we get the recognition of what this, Oh, it's the junk drawer. It's the junk drawer. So we've all got one. Everyone has. And I always say, you know, we just had an election. People are on all different different sides. The thing that brings us all together, no matter what your politics, your religion, anything, you've all got this drawer. We've all got the drawer of cords and pennies and receipts. We can come together around the drawer. Everybody's got the drawer. All right, let's apply the last method to the drawer. I'm going to need your participation. So just keep your fingers out on the keyboard. I want you to think about the vision of a junk drawer. What would you want your junk drawer to look like and how would you want it to feel? You know, you've got one at home. You know, and type in the chat if you've got an answer. You know how you feel when you open it up and you look inside. What would you like to see? And how would you like to feel ideally when you open that up? It's kind of a hard question, actually. And that's why it's really important because we have to know what we're working toward. So Kim, if you see any answers, let me know. How do we want the I junk drawer it. to look and feel? Rachel wants hers to be organized and practical. Beautiful. I love it. It says clarity. Um, and we have neat and you can see everything. I love it. I love it. Now, second question, the purpose, because we all have one or more. So what do we want to use it for? What's the purpose of the junk drawer? Why do we have it? What's it for? Let's get clear on why it exists. Why are we designating an entire drawer in the kitchen to this? What's the purpose? If you have an idea, put that in the chat. What's it for? Why why do we all recognize it? Why do we all have one? What's the purpose of this space? Kim, if you see any good answers or, or any answers, all answers are good answers. Yeah. If you see any answers, let me know. So let's see here. You know, it says you have very few items like this in your house. And so that, that's kind of how they end up together. Yeah. Um, you know, frequently used small items, mm. stuff we might need occasionally, scissors, tape, and, and trying to, you know, it's kind of, it, you know, almost the opposite of we're trying to make it easy to use, but we make it harder to use by throwing all the stuff in there. <laughs> yes. Yes. Awesome. Wonderful answers, guys. And so, so what you're going to do for the junk drawer or any other space, right? This is just an example. You're going to get clear on the vision and the purpose. And I want you to actually write it down and tape it up with painter's tape while you're working, because this becomes the North Star. This becomes what you're working toward. And you can always judge everything you find against that. Remember, once you've done this, you've already said no to a lot of things you're going to find. And so it makes it really clear what you're working toward. And this might seem like a step you can skip. And I'll tell you, when I worked in home with clients, sometimes I did skip it and I regretted it every single time. Because when we don't do this, we we start this process without clarity on what we're really working towards. So laying out the vision and the purpose is the first step. All right. So then the second step is empty. Now, in my example, I was working with a drawer. I literally just dumped it out on the floor. Easy peasy. Again, if you have a bigger space, you would you would need to maybe empty it in chunks. Then I did the sorting twice. And I actually, I had my son Orlando, he was about 11 when I took these pictures. So he helped me with this. My triplets are 13 now, by the way. I don't know if I added that. Um, but yeah, they're, they're teenagers. Pray for me. I have, I have three teenagers. Um, so we sorted it twice. The first sort was the like with like. So we put everything that was similar together, the paper, the cords and tech, the personal care items, memorabilia, tools, 
toys, office supplies, money and gift cards, and some miscellaneous things that didn't have any other buddies that they went with. So this is the first sort. We made it really clear what kinds of things we had in the drawer. And then we did the second sort where we went through each of those piles and Orlando helped me and we decided, is this trash, keep, sell elsewhere, go somewhere else in the house or the car or my purse or donation. And so we got really clear on what we were keeping. So if you think about these signs here, imagine that you know, you've, you've decided what's going where, you're really then only dealing with the keeps. So you can see how much less stuff you're dealing with at this point, because your donations are gonna go to donation, your trash is going in the trash, elsewhere items are gonna go where they belong. If you have sell items, you will sell them, which you probably don't have any sell items from the junk drawer, but then you're just left with the keepers. And then you do the last step, which is systemize it. You put it back in an organized and simplified way. And I didn't buy any special organizing tools for this. I was just using what we had. I used a Ziploc bag. I had a little insert thing and a little pencil container. And But you can see that this is how you get those before and after shots. But you go through that whole process first. I didn't go immediately to buying containers for my stuff. I didn't go immediately to just trying to organize it. I got really clear on what I wanted, what my vision and purpose was. And then I had the guts. I had a process and I let go of everything else. Okay, so there you see it again, the whole last method um, all laid out there. Um, if you're ready to get started, which I hope you are, I hope you're excited. I do have a free gift for you. It is called my Simplicity Starter Guide. And the goal of this is to help you get a plan in your hand so that you could start decluttering your home. Because a lot of times, again, we look around and we're like, I don't even know where to begin. So what this does is it gives you a handout with some questions, and they're the questions that I would ask you if I was going through your home with you. You answer the questions based on your answers. You create a customized checklist that's ranked in order of where you should start to where you should go next and next and next, and then you have a plan of your decluttering or simplicity plan for your home. So if you want that, you can text the word less is more all as one word to this number. It's 773-770-4377. Um, this will also be on the next slide. So don't worry if you didn't grab it on this one, but that's just a free um, gift for you if that would be helpful for you. Um, if you wanna continue the Simplicity Conversation with me, again, you can get the free guide, text less is more to that number. Uh, you can curl up with my book if you would like to, you can find it on Amazon. Uh, if you're a social media person, we could connect there. The places I like to hang out most are on Facebook in my Minimalism is Fun Facebook group. So you can search for that. It is a group for working moms. Um, but if you are not a working mom, you are more than welcome to join us as well. We talk about simplicity, decluttering. We do fun challenges. And it's a really great place to get support from like-minded people. So you can search for us on Facebook there. Or if you use Instagram, you can find me there with the handle at Rose Lounsbury. And that is all I have for you today. Um, Kim, I would love to know if we have any questions. Um, I do want to thank everybody, by the way, for being here today. I hope you, you are on fire for simplifying your life. Um, but I'm here to answer any questions that, that might have come in during the talk or any that are coming in right now. Absolutely. And we do have a few, um, but those of you, if you want to put one in, please do, and we will try to get to you. Um, uh, you've definitely inspired someone to go through uh, at least some clothing items that she feels guilty that she bought in the first place. Um, things that she you knew, excess, she knew she didn't need. Um, so that's great. But we had somebody ask a question about wedding gifts in particular. And I know you talk about gifts at one point in time in your chat talk, but the wedding gift thing is really interesting because you might have asked for it at one point in time, right? Um, and then there are the ones that you do get that you didn't ask for, but you know, you kind of have that, is it to quote bad juju to get rid of a wedding gift? <laughs> yeah, so gifts are a really big question. And you know, even if we asked for it, you know, I know the things that I asked for at age 23 when I was registering at Bed Bath & Beyond may not necessarily be the things in my 30s and 40s that are serving me the best. You know, when we ask for gifts, we don't always know if we're going to be using them. So one of the things that I always say with gifts um, is, would you buy it for yourself now? So let's say we have 
a panini press, you know, typical type of wedding gift that someone might get. We asked for it. We registered for it. We thought in our married life, me and the partner are going to be getting up every weekend. We're going to make these fancy paninis. It's going to be great. But you know what? You're ordering Jimmy John's because you don't want to get the panini press out. You don't want to make the paninis. It's all right. You didn't know this. You had these grand ideals and it's okay. So the panini press now, you could ask yourself, okay, would I buy this for myself? You know, it was given to be to me by my friend whom I love. Um, but if I didn't own this, would I take my $75 or whatever it costs to Target and buy this for myself today? Probably the answer is no. If that's the case, you can let that go. And one of the things that I said in my TED Talk, and I will repeat because I think it's really helpful for gifts, is if you've said thank you to the person, your obligation to the gift and the giver is done. I guarantee you probably said thank you to that person. You might have even sent a thank you note or thank you text. You've thanked them. That was all you had to do. Once you've thanked someone, it's now yours. You can do with it as you want. If it's useful to you, if it's beautiful to you, please use it, enjoy it, bring it into your life. But if it's not, let it go. Somebody else out there wants to make those paninis and you are depriving them of the chance. So let it go so someone else can enjoy and you have more space in your life and your kitchen for the things that really matter to you. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, when we first started talking, somebody put in that the idea of simplicity and minimalism was was anxiety was a word that they came up with. And I think our question here kind of hits on that, which is, have you? how do you handle regret? Have you had regret? So this person says, I have a glass citrus juicer. I never use it, but if I get rid of it, what if I want to use it one day? Mm, <laughs> how, yeah. Talk about that. You're talking about being brave. How, how do you how do you do that and stay that way? Yeah. So kind of what they're asking about is the um, but what if I need it someday right. type of thinking, right? And my favorite way to talk about this type of question is uh, using Dr. Phil as an example. Some of us may remember Dr. Phil. I used to love him, and one of the 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 things about Dr. Phil that was so great were his one-liners that he would just deliver and they were so spot on. And so something that you would typically see on Dr. Phil was a couple and they're having problems in the marriage and somebody is, is not treating the other person very well. But then one of the, the other person in the, in the relationship would say, well, I just think they're going to change. They're going to change this time. It's going to be different. And the whole audience is like, they're not going to change. And that is when Dr. Phil would deliver one of my favorite lines and he would say, the best indicator of past of future behavior is past behavior. And the audience would clap and it was great. The best indicator of future behavior is past behavior. So if you think of your citrus juicer or whatever it is, the best indicator of you needing to use it in the future is you having used it in the past. So none of us have a crystal ball to know if 10 years from now you're going to get into juicing and you're going to just be hardcore into it and juicing every day with a citrus juicer. I can't know that and you can't know that. The only thing you can know is today, what evidence do I have that I'm a juicer? The only evidence you have for future use is past use. So if you haven't used it in the past, the likelihood of you needing to use it in the future is very, very slim. I will tell you, I have decluttered things that I've regretted, a like handful of small things. I'm so happy that I've decluttered that handful of small things that were relatively easy to obtain again. I'm guessing if you wanted a citrus juicer, again, it's not going to break your bank to get a new one. But because I was able to let go of the fear of, will I need it someday, it enabled me to let go of the other, you know, 98.97% of things that I have never missed and that I have never regretted. And the net benefit of letting go of those things far outweighs the small handful of things that I had to repurchase. So that's what I would tell you if you're struggling with letting go of things because you might need it someday, you probably won't. And in the event that you do, it's okay. You can, prop most things, there's this rule, um, the minimalists, uh, Ryan Nicodemus and Joshua Fields Milburn, they have a documentary, maybe you've watched on, on Netflix, they have a podcast. They're from Dayton as well, which is weird. I don't know them. A lot of minimalists from Dayton, apparently. Um, they have a thing called the 2020 rule, which I think is great. And they say, you know, if you're worried about needing something in the future, ask yourself, could I replace this for less than $20 with less than 20 minutes of my time? For many of the things that we're hemming and hawing about, that actually applies. 
you could, with Amazon, you could probably replace most things with less than 20 minutes of your time. And a lot of the things like a juicer or a spatula or some towels, yeah, you could probably get them for less than 20 bucks. So I think that's a good barometer, a good tool to use if you're struggling with letting go of things that you might need in the future. So hopefully that's helpful. Great. Um, thank you for that. Um, we do have time for a few more questions. I know that, you know, you talked about starting with the things that are easy, but ultimately we do have to get to those things are hard that are hard. And someone said that they're at the stage of the photos. Um, and sentimental items, you know, from how, what are tips for getting those things simplified and organized when that time comes? Yeah. So the first tip is what it sounds like this person has done, which is they have waited until they've decluttered and simplified easier things before they get to the hard things. And with the things like photos and memorabilia, I would do a similar thing with the last method, which is get really clear about what you want. You know, when it comes to memorabilia, how much memorabilia would you enjoy looking at? And I usually tell people to think in tubs because often it's like one tub, um, two tubs, three tubs, whatever. I personally have just one tub myself. Um, but think about how much you want to keep, how much you would enjoy. And then you kind of have your set containment amount and then you go through and you decide, okay, is this something that goes in the one tub or not? And I always tell people to do this in really small chunks. Um, memorabilia, I, I know going through my own, I have been brought to tears. It can be really, really emotional. So I would say, you know, 15, 20 minutes of going through yes or no. And I always just say with memorabilia, you want to listen to your heart. Um, only two things can happen to memorabilia over time. One is it becomes more important to you with time. Two is it becomes less important to you with time. And the only way you know the difference is by listening to your heart and deciding, like, has this become more meaningful to me with the passage of time? If yes, that's probably something you're going to keep. Or your heart will tell you, you know, it seemed really special when, when they were in preschool and I kept all of these worksheets they brought home. It seems really important at that time. But now that my kids are 20, it's not as important as it was back then. And then it's okay to let them go. So it's really setting a set containment amount. And that could be for photographs too. If you want to have one photo album per year or one photo album per event or one photo album total, okay, that's your containment amount. And then you go through your pictures and decide, you know, which of these have become more meaningful to you with time, which have become less meaningful to you over time. And, and that's really, you know, kind of in a quick amount of time, the best way that I could explain how to go through memorabilia, it's really a, a heart centered activity. Your heart will tell you the truth if it's become more or less valuable to you. Right. Um, I, I, I had to laugh when you mentioned the papers and the kids drawings. I have, you know, two, you know, preteen and teen now, and I definitely still have the, the preschool drawings and things like that. And, and, Someone here says how to deal with all the paper. So I think some of that is that paper, which you addressed, but bills and, and things, you know, you know, the manuals you get with everything that you buy that you decide to keep. Mm -hmm. um, any tips on organizing paper? Yeah. Yeah. So I will give you like a real quick rundown of my paper system. And also just know this works for email as well. So this is for paper that is not in that sentimental category. This is paper we use to run our lives, the bills and that sort of thing. And it's an acronym called RAFT. I love acronyms because they just help. And so a lot of times people feel like they're drowning in paper, even in the digital age, or especially email, we feel like we're drowning in email. Um, and if you were actually drowning, what would save you? A RAFT. If you're drowning in paper or email, what will save you? A RAFT, R-A-F-T. It stands for Read, Action, File, Trash. And so what you do is you just go through each piece of paper or each email. And, you, and those are the only four things you can do with paper or email, by the way. You can read it. You can take action on it. You could file it or you could trash it or shred it or recycle it, whatever you want to do, archive it. Um, and you just start top down, read, action, file, trash, read, action, file, trash. And what that does, and I use this myself when I will even kind of let my email or my paper get backed up. I'm like, okay, Rose, use the raft. And I just start making the four piles on my table or going through my email with those four categories in mind. And what it does is it gives you a template or a framework on which to start sorting. Now I have like way, I do like whole presentations on this. 
that will get you started. If you're interested, go to my website. Um, just Google like Rose Lounsbury paper decluttering or something like that. You'll find whole articles where I go into more depth on how to do this. Um, you'll also find, I think I even have a video on there. If you Google Rose Lounsbury email, you'll probably find a video that shows you um, me in my inbox is rafting to show you how to use it in the email sphere. It's very similar to the paper sphere. So um, go to my website, go to my blog. I have lots of articles and, and definitely paper is on there. And um, so hopefully that gets you started and you can research more if you need to. Well, I know what I'll be doing this afternoon. Um, <laughs> we are out of time here. So I wanna thank you Rose so much for your time today. It was such a pleasure to talk with you, to just hear your positivity um, and your message today. I think it resonates so much um, with a lot of us today. And I just really thank you um, for sharing your wisdom with us. And thanks to all of you that tuned in and submitted questions. We invite you to check out our other upcoming web webinars by visiting alumlc.org slash Miami OH. And save the date for the Miami Women Leadership Symposium. It is Friday, April 28th in Oxford. So thank you again for watching. Thank you so much, Rose, for being here. And everybody have a great rest of your day. Love and honor. Bye.